recall from our earlier lectures that the trajectory of anti-discrimination legislation has largely followed something of a linear timeline in a variety of jurisdictions. We can denote three stages, prohibited exclusion, forced inclusion, and institutional change. In the past couple of decades, we've witnessed a fusion of these stages with contemporary regulatory frameworks exhibiting aspirations to all three stages, now denoted as legislative strategies. This makes sense. When focused on the objective, equality, rather than the processes, all strategies are fair game. One such strategy that possesses elements primarily of the second and third, forced inclusion and institutional change, is known by many names. Affirmative action, positive discrimination, and sometimes proactive measures. These are used to describe tools of forced inclusion. The strategy has been frequently used in labor markets and educational settings as a means of achieving parity of participation for a variety of disadvantaged social groups. It has also appeared in sports teams, political parties, and even benefits schemes. In the labor market, our social institution of interest for the moment, different approaches have been adopted in different jurisdictions. In India, for instance, Quotas have been established to redress inequalities among castes in public sector employment. In the USA, federal contractors must demonstrate equal hiring practices to qualify for access to government contract. There are two primary objectives in positive discriminatory measures. First, we are looking to alter the composition of workforces to raise the representation of disadvantaged groups. And second, to reduce instances of bias toward the same groups, thus promoting levels of social transformation. Affirmative action was introduced into Northern Ireland's legislative framework via the Fair Employment Act 1989. The Fair Employment Act 1989 was designed to replace earlier labor legislation that dated to 1976. While the earlier legislation focused on prohibiting exclusion, the latest legislation sought to add elements of forced inclusion and institutional transformation. Despite their differences, each statute had a parallel purpose, to mollify the split between the Catholic and Protestant communities. Both communities were distinguished by distinct religious affiliations, but also by differences in political allegiances that produced what we saw as both voluntary and involuntary forms of segregation across social institutions, and it also produced significant inequalities between the communities. Catholics were widely disadvantaged across Northern Irish society. They were two and a half times more likely to be unemployed than Protestants. They were overly represented in semi-skilled and unskilled work. They're almost absent from the top public service positions. In contrast, Protestants were largely favored by the system. Zoning policies and tax incentives targeted industries and regions with high Protestant representation. Trade unions maintain Protestant monopoly in the most lucrative of industries, and Protestants enjoyed higher pay than their Catholic counterparts. These measures were indicative not only of numerical bias, but also of social tension. Statistics intertwined with segregation, antagonism, and of course, violence. One of the first objectives of the Fair Employment Act of 1989 was to tend to these imbalances as a means of addressing the social tension. Many have argued that communal violence does not occur in a vacuum. They point to the importance of studying the links between social processes such as structural inequality and social cleavages. Indeed, it is no surprise that those societies with greater harmony across economic, cultural, and political spheres are characterized by fewer incidents of violence and fewer incidences of conflict. Enter the Fair Employment Legislation of 1989 that sought to address imbalances within the workplace. Imbalances were commonplace for Protestants through their alliances with England, had over several decades become the dominant economic community in Northern Ireland. 
many Protestants argued that by rejecting state authority, as wielded by the local Protestant-dominated parliament, Catholics had lost their citizenship rights. Disloyalty was to be punished by refusing Catholics employment. The statutes, the original ones, thus targeted discrimination in the workplace by prohibiting discrimination based upon religious affiliation. The 1989 statute, however, went further, seeking to force the economic inclusion of Catholics and to increase their political participation. From prohibited exclusion to forced inclusion, ultimately leading to institutional transformation. The 1989 statute was highly innovative. A monitoring program was established to verify that both Catholics and Protestants were fairly represented across an array of sectors. Workers were monitored for their religious affiliation and duties imposed upon employers to adjust their hiring or promotional activities to account for demographics. Alongside the monitoring and reporting duties were a series of enforcement mechanisms, whereby employers who refused to comply could be sanctioned. The Fair Employment Commission did not simply rely on reports by employers as it possessed investigative powers and could probe matters or industries of its own volition. The reports themselves were made public and by 1999, the mandate was extended to include discrimination on grounds of age, disability, race, sex, political opinion, and more. Finally, the Affirmative Action Program, beginning with the Fair Employment Act, was the product of negotiations between government agencies and employers. Sanctions were available, as were investigative powers. It was felt that persuasion and compromise would be a better approach. The program was designed to be proactive, collaborative, and comprehensive, and in fact, unlike anything that had been seen in the UK at that time. It has rightfully been described as one of the most innovative fair equity legislations to emerge in the European Union. In addition to these elements, the Northern Irish statute also applied to public and private sectors. Unlike England, which focused on the private sector, and the EU that targeted the public sector. It was also, the legislation was also of symmetrical application. By this we mean that both Catholic and Protestant underrepresentation were to be redressed. As discussed in an earlier lecture, in a conflict-based society, focus is on achieving fair representation of both communities rather than redressing the grievances of a single one, as the latter is likely to inflame ethnic tension. The Fair Employment Act, as well as the Good Friday Agreement and foreign investment, combine to produce a positive impact on the Northern Irish economy and to address some of the inequalities that were once widespread. Integration also impacted attitudes towards opposing communities with fewer workers expressing a desire to be employed in a segregated workplace. The Fair Employment Commission had begun by desegregating the larger industries before moving on to medium-sized firms. Unsurprisingly, they also focused on those industries, those sectors that were the most heavily segregated. Employees were required to monitor, proactively adjust, and report on the hiring and promotional practices implemented to produce more balanced representation. The Commission, for its part, published reports, what some have described as a naming and shaming exercise, to celebrate and to condemn the best and worst performers. Most industries have experienced significant adjustments in their demographic composition, with Catholics and Protestants becoming equally represented across a range of industries. There is empirical support for the claim that the Affirmative Action Program was most successful where the agreements were reached between the employers and the Commission, rather than the ones who were either imposed upon them or where sanctions were tied to non-compliance. Again, this makes sense. Voluntary rather than involuntary interventions are likely to be more well-received and thus more diligently 
implemented. There is also evidence, however, that the consistent monitoring of firms and the availability of the investigative powers and the sanctioning powers of the commission, as well as the public reports, had an impact on the programs. We're not suggesting that firms were coerced into acting, rather the availability of accountability mechanisms created the type of climate whereby action was likely to be taken, whereby momentum could be achieved. This argument can be made because of the near absence of the use of either sanctions or threats in propelling change. These were largely unnecessary in the Northern Irish context. To conclude, two primary communities dominate Northern Ireland, Catholic and Protestant. Historical circumstances were such that these two communities have been in conflict for several decades. The privileges enjoyed by the Protestants resulted in their control of major sectors of the Northern Irish economy. When filtered through the prism of ethnic conflict, ethnic-based economic control by Protestants resulted in the exclusion of many members of the Catholic community. Now, this is hardly a unique story. Similar situations have played out in countries across the world, including the United States, Canada, France, Germany, India, and many others. Northern Ireland, for its part, sought to address inequalities and grievances by adopting an affirmative action program, forcing the inclusion of Catholics in the most highly segregated sectors of the economy. The government's efforts were hardly one-sided, with reciprocal agreements reached with an array of employers. Rather than force the inclusion of Catholics, the aim was to transform popular attitudes towards each community and effectively transform the community as a whole. Two primary objectives seem to have been achieved. Most sectors have been desegregated and attitudes of workers have changed. All in all, this points to a legislative success. The Fair Employment Act, the monitoring system, the reports, all together created the momentum needed to promote fair employment, but also to redress widespread structural inequalities. In this way, for all its problems, Northern Ireland could represent a model for other jurisdictions motivated to address the imbalances within their own societies. Thank you.